<laughs> so um, today is the 19th of Kislev. I'm sure you heard before we start the Tanya, I'm going to just introduce with the 19th of Kislev and how the Tanya is so um, related to this whole day. The 19th of Kislev is the reason why the Tanya exists today. Sorry, someone just, who, who just did that? I think someone wants to be admitted and I can't see them. No, mine are. Let me just see. How do I see them? No, but my roots. Was it you just that just re entered, Denisa? No, I just. So I don't see the person who just came in and um, it doesn't show me anything. Okay. I hope no one's waiting. Um, okay, fine. So. <coughs> Back uh, in 19, I want to get the right, actually, wh what what year was it? What year was it? Let me just get the right year. Okay. 1798. 1798 was when the Alter Rebbe, he was um, spreading Hasidus, and what he was doing that got um, some people upset, and when I say some people, it was unfortunately it was Jewish people, was that he um, removed the barrier between um, like important sages, like people who know how to learn, and simple people. He removed that barrier, like we learned in Tanya, how you can't really tell or judge a person. It's really inside their work. A person, it's all about the inside work. So he removed that concept of like the really high scholars and the simple people. Because in those times, you know, it used to be that the Jewish people, everyone knew how to learn and was well learned. Even if there was, you know, Sadiqim and, and people who weren't Sadiqim. But there was never a huge gap like back then of scholarly people who were like high society of the Jewish people and simple people who didn't know how to read Hebrew. They didn't know how to learn. Maybe they knew how to read Hebrew. Maybe they knew how to like to pray, but they couldn't understand the Torah. They couldn't, they were usually people, you know, of trades, you know, they would work the land or do different manual activity and they really didn't know how to learn. They would call, they were called Amarets, like simple people people of the land. So the, uh -huh. the gap was very, very big. And Rabbi, and the first it started, the Baal Shem Tev, he would come and he would show his Hasidim, who were high, highly educated, very intellectual people, how these people are really as important and even more important as you. And he made them close their eyes and they listened to the prayers of these people and how it brought so much pleasure to God. And so he started that concept. And then the Alter Rebbe, through the Tanya, explained that concept in a deeper way. So before the Tanya, he would give discourses, Hasidic discourses, and he really removed that gap between, um, what do they call it? Segregating? Segregating? Well, if it, if it was done consciously, yeah, it's segregated. It was done consciously. Like like the scholarly were given a lot of honor. The, 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 the people who were simple were put in the back. And, and some Jewish people really didn't like that. Like, it's how dare right you? Right and it, it still exists, but not as strong as back it's then. Like an elitism. Exactly. It was the elites that, you know, like they gave the honor to the, you know, and the marriage between the, you know, only scholarly people. And, oh. and, um, and, and because he tried, he was removing that because it's not true. It's not the truth. They, um, they were really against him. And they fought against him to the point where they went to the czar and they complained that he is um, doing a revolution. He was sending tzedakah to Israel, which was then under the Turkish regime, Ottoman. Uh, Otto Ottoman. And he was giving money for the Jews because there was always Jews living there to the poor people. They were very poor. And he, he, they, they claimed... Turkey and I guess Russia was against each other, and and they they accused him falsely that he was creating a rebellion and supporting the Ottoman um, regime, and um, because of that, the Tsar was scared of change, 
and took him. And the, there's a whole story of how he went to prison, how horrible it was. It was the worst prison that no one survives. Like oh. you die, you don't come alive. And obviously he, he survived when he got to prison. I'm not going to say the story of how he got to prison, all the details, because it's too long. When he got to pre- prison, the Baal Shem Tov, Mm-hmm. And the another rabbi, I think the Magid, I'm not sure. Two of people that passed away, his his um, his teachers, they came to him and he said, "Why am I in prison?" Because he knows obviously that anything that happens in the world represents something up there. So he said, because there's. Um, there's a controversy happening in, in the sky where the um, angels don't want you to reveal what you're revealing. You're revealing too many secrets. And not only that, you're revealing it to people who don't appreciate it and are not, you know, there was papers of his discourses lying on the floor. Like it's, it's a waste. This is holy. This is the secrets of God. You know, the, the way that God communicates to the human in the most secretive possible way. So he said, okay, so maybe I should stop. He said, no, if you come out of jail, that means you should continue. That means that in Shemaim, Hashem wants you to continue. And after 53 days in jail, 53 horrible days, they came, they interviewed him, they, they confused him, they, and no matter what, he never lost, obviously, his uh, track of mind. He knew what time he felt, you know. A lot of details that I, I'm sure my husband's going to tell you guys tomorrow, maybe in more, more details. He was released, and when he came out, after that, that's when he wrote the Tanya, 53 chapters, representing the 53 days that he spent in jail, and he got his answer that, yes, he should continue teaching and spreading Hasidus, and this was done, this happened on the 19th of Kislev, today, um, you know, 1798, so how how many years ago? Uh, Over 200? and. 20, around, yeah, 225 years, um, he was released, and it's a celebration, it's called Rosh Hashanah La Chassidus, that means it's the, the like, like the day that, you know, Chassidus was, was approved by Shemayim, and yes, and we celebrate it, and we learn the Tanya, and that's why it's so appropriate to learn, to continue learning, so, we're going to, I think the best way, now that we got this little introduction, I, oh, I want to add something really interesting to the introduction is that um, there's um, some, I don't know who said it. I don't know if it was the Rebbe or one of the Rebbe who said that when he wrote the Tanya, in one of the chapters, he wrote the word MS, truth. And this Rabbi, this Rebbe said that if he would have removed that word, he would have had many more chassidim, many more followers. Because the Tanya, what does it bring? It brings the hard truth that people and that the Jewish people, especially the high scholarlies, didn't want to face. It was a truth that was very hard. It was telling them you're nothing. You know, for them, they were like super important. You learn the Tanya, you're nothing. You learn you're nothing. It was a very hard truth that he chose not to cover up, not to uh, minimize, but really write the truth as it is. And he lost or didn't get as many followers as he would have had. Today, Hasidus is in the every communities, whether they call themselves Hasidim or not, it's in every <clears throat> communities. Chabad Hasidus really continued from the Alter Rebbe and stayed to the truth, the most essential truth, um, through, through the seven um, Rebbe's, all the other Hasidim are branches of the Baal Shem Tev. So they took concepts, but they didn't bring it down to the level where Chabad Hasidis brought it down to. So they have, you know, concept, but their philosophy is very, very different than Chabad, as you can tell today. But today, even people who are not Hasidim are, have, are affected by Hasidis. It, it is part, there's a, okay, one more story. There's a famous story where um, the Rebbe said that Yutes Kislev represents the, the a, a sto- um, there's a mashal, how do you call a mashal, a parable? An exemple. An exemple. Mais plus qu'un exemple, c'est pas un exemple. C'est, c'est quoi une par- Parce que les mashal en hébreu, c'est par exemple. Oui, mais une mash- métaphore. Une métaphore d'un prince, a prince who is very sick. 
and all the doctors come and they can't find a solution. He's dying sick. Finally, one doctor said, I have a solution, but it's going to cost you a lot. He says, you see your crown? You have your ju jewel there? Mm -hmm. You have to crush it. And with that jewel, give it to him. And even if one drop falls, even if like some drops fall out, as long as one drop goes in, he's going to feel better. And the king agrees to it, even if he's going to lose it. His, it's worth his whole fortune because he said, the whole reason for my crown is my prince. So that represents Hasidus. That was the crown jewel of God that was brought down to the lowest and even got lost on the way or misunderstood. But one drop came in and revived the Jewish people. The Jewish people were at a time where they were kind of sick and needed that um, boost. So, okay. So now chapter 18. I don't know how many chapters you missed. But I just want to say that. So 13. Okay. So let me just tell you. I literally. Which one is this one? 18, 18. So, four chapters, okay, but from from um, first chapter to the 17 was just an introduction to what we're learning now, was just to help us understand the concepts of what we're going to be learning now. What we're going to be learning now is very, I had a very hard time learning it. I, I just want to say I like, I like had to relearn it. I, I just learned a few lines. It's concepts that it, it goes a little bit more deeper into into concepts and it gives us more tools of how to attain everything we learned from before so what we were what we were learning before in short quickly we we're talking about it's not enough to just do mitzvot and learn torah it's very important to god to have that love and connection for him god wants that relationship with us and to just do something mechanically or robotically is not enough. You have to actually have a feeling. Now, what does the Tanya tell us? The Tanya tells us that it's not possible to, a man cannot control his heart. Only tzaddikim master their heart. So we can't create a feeling that doesn't exist. If someone doesn't feel love for God, they cannot create that feeling no matter how hard they try. They cannot create that feeling. So what happens? So what do you do? How do you, how do you fulfill the mitzvah of loving God if you can't create that feeling? So um, we learned about a concept of tivuna, which is a love in your mind. It's a love that through meditation and through um, learning and, and really putting yourself into it, you can come to an understanding which is called the love of a, a mind. It doesn't go to the heart, but it's, it's still a, heart, a love. And that's good enough to say that you love Hashem, that you're, that's enough to motivate you to do Torah and Mitzvah. How do you know? If this love brings you to action, then that love is strong enough and it's real. Okay, so it's called Tifuna, and that's what we finished chapter 17, that by how, how is this close to us? How, how is it close to us to serve God and to feel connected to God? Is by meditating to the point where it brings you to action and it brings you to um to um i just want to make sure no one's waiting in the waiting room because i couldn't okay it's fine um that love brings you to an action to want to connect to god and to want to serve him okay yeah. so that's that's what we ended off with now i wasn't satisfied with the answer because and it's funny because i wasn't but i said okay fine i'll accept it and then in this chapter it's it it starts the question it says there's a pasuk, okay? It is very, I'm going to retranslate it. So so I know you guys know what it means, but for Dorit, or maybe you don't, you, you'll, you'll, I just want to get, it says, so it says, for this thing, for this thing is very near to you in your mouth and in your heart that you may do it. What is it talking about? That Torah and Mitzvot is very near. It's very accessible, oh, okay. and that we can do it. It's in our heart, uh, in our um, mouth, and in our heart that we may do it. Okay. So we explained in the previous chapter that it's only how is it near? 
that in our hearts, if, if our heart is connected to an action, if our heart, if our meditation leads us to an acting, to doing Torah mitzvot, that means it's, it's near, that's how it's near our heart, right? But it, it's not that satisfying to think that meditation and really thinking about God is something very near, right? What do you think? Do you find that it's near if you have to meditate and really think about God in order to have that feeling that will make you want to connect to him or that, that feeling in your mind? Is que tu trouves que c'est proche? What about people? Uh, uh, so, no, uh, sorry. Uh, Is que tu penses que c'est accessible? Does it sound accessible? To meditate? When it says that it's very near, that means it's very accessible. When this pasuk said it's very near to us, yeah, it means that Torah mitzvah is very accessible. Do you find that it, no. it seems accessible when we have to really meditate and think about God in order to bring us to an action? Do you find that is something near? Not if I have to meditate on it. Right. So I don't think I don't also. Know. So for me, I wasn't so satisfied. So we know it's doable, mm -hmm. that anybody can do it, but I wouldn't call it near. So that's where, and, and the Baal Shem Tov adds, the Baal Shem Tov, sorry, the Alter Rebbe adds that there, there are some people, and I think he's talking about those simple people, that don't, that cannot meditate. They can't think, they don't have the mind capacity to think about God or the knowledge or the, the you know, they don't know how to meditate. How are they going to connect to God if they can't do it? How can you say that it's near to them? How can you say when a pasuk is written in the Torah that says that Torah is very near to us, it's true. How is it true? So that's when the Alter Rebbe introduces something very interesting. And I'm going to start it with the story. There's Rabbi Yoshua ben Hananiah. He was traveling and he got to a fork in the road. And he asked, there was a little boy over there and he asked him, I'm, I want to go to this city. How do I go? Which way do I go? Which The right side or the left side? He said, you can either go the long, short way or, or the short, long way. So he heard short, long way. He went the short way. When he went there, it was very quick. But right before the city, there was like a really uh, bushy and hills and things that he couldn't get to the city. He had to come back and go the long way. Way And when he came back, he met the boy. He said, you, you told me this was the short way. He said, I also told you it was the long way. And he taught, he learned a big lesson over here. There's two ways of it, getting to stuff in life, getting to things. And, and in the Tanya, getting to that love and connection to God. There is the long, short way. Or there's a short, long way. So what, yes, so the long, short way and the short, long way. And this is something that you can apply in anything in your life, anything you want to go get to, anything you want to accomplish. There are two ways of getting there. I would choose spontaneously the long, short way. The long, short way? No, most of us use the short, long way. It's just like that. What's the long, short way? The long, short way to get to a deep, loving connection with God is the one we just learned about, is the one where you meditate, is the one where you think about God, you l learn until you create that feeling that leads you to an action. It's long, it's hard, it doesn't seem near, but it's short because once you go through that process, you're going to have a steady, constant relationship, a healthy relationship with God. But it's not for everyone. And it's not going to work for everyone. And yes, there are two ways to everything. And there's not everyone who can sit there and meditate. So then the, the Alter Rebbe introduces us to something that we knew about, but he explains it even more. And I'm going to read inside the Tanya, okay? Chapter 18. Ulatasafes bir be'er hetev 
Milas To explain more clearly and more precisely the word very, okay, because the Pasuk says the thing is very close in the verse, for this thing is very near to you in your heart and in your mind. So how is it very close to us? How do we learn what this very means? Every word in the Torah has a meaning. There's no word that are not. So if the Torah said it's very close to you, the Torah meant it's very close to you. What does that mean? What is this talking about? One should recognize with certainty that even the person who has only a limited understanding of God's greatness and he has no heart to comprehend the greatness of the blessed infinite God. Okay, so this is talking about a simple person who can't meditate and think he's very limited. Okay, Galut, the, the exile brought the Jewish people to to a low level where we were limited before that everyone and, and i think i mean it's getting back but in those time of russia sp specifically people were very limited with the suffering with being poor with being with the wars and all of that they were very limited and not everyone there was some people who were called you know both they, they their their mind couldn't meditate and think about god so what do those people even those people it's very near how is it possible the holy mimenu de khila so he has no, so he can't um he 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 can produce through medit so he cannot produce through meditation and fear of love even in his mind and understanding alone yet it is very a very near thing for that person to guard himself from from um, transgressing and to practice the commandments of the Torah and the study of Torah with counterbalance, um, which counterbalances them all. So even if that person cannot meditate and cannot come to that love in his mind, he's still able to attain it. How? He can fulfill all this in his mouth and in his heart, in the true sense of heart. This is the hidden love present in the heart of all Jews, which is an inheritance to us from our patriarchs. Okay, so I'm going to stop there and I'm going to explain. In every single Jew, no matter what, they have a love that's hidden. For some people, it's hidden. For some people, it's re revealed. Most of us, it's it's hidden, but it's in there. It's Inherit, you know, a baby, when he's born, he comes with packages, with things, and all we need to do, our, our, the parent's job is to reveal those talents and those hidden emotion and those hidden treasures, We but, but we're born with it. It's there. Everyone has it. You mean hidden love of God? Uh, hidden love of God, okay. yes. So that person who cannot come to meditating and creating an emotion, even an emotion in his mind, he has a love hidden with him. There's a famous story, I forgot the person, a famous story of a, of a um, Jewish person who was not practicing anything. I forgot his name. I, I should find more details, but he wasn't religious. He was married to a non-Jew his whole life. No one questioned, he didn't question anything. And when finally he was threatened, his Judaism was, was threatened suddenly, he gave up his life and was killed for being Jewish and did not want to give up his Judaism. What happened here? Okay, I said the story in very short, but so many times you can see people, you know, there, there, there is that concept of people not being connected at all. And the minute they're threatened, that's when the hidden love comes out. And during the Holocaust, it happened so many times, exactly. It's a hidden love that is in, it's innate. We can't understand. And we are not connected to it unless we're threatened by it. How can we connect to it when we're not threatened? That's what the time is going to teach us. How to connect to that love that's going to be awakened enough to motivate us to do Torah and Mitzvot and to want to connect to God. The, the God is, is compared, I just want to see the time. Okay. God is compared 
to the Jewish people as our spouse, like as a husband and wife, right? He compares the, that yeah. by Matan Torah, he married, um, he married the Jewish people. But the words that God used is Rayati and Achoti. He uses two words. And in one of the Psukim, I'm sorry, I'm not bringing the exact Pasuk, but he, he describes the Jewish people as my wife, and my sister. Why? Not kids? No. Well, sometimes that's in different situations. Yes, also as our father, as a fatherly love or as a, yeah. So, yeah, there's different relationships we can have um, with God. So, but, but at Matan Torah, the, the relationship that was, was as a bride and as a sister. Why? Because in a relationship... There's two, there, you have to have that balance of two um, attachments, I guess, two ways of attaching. There's a way of a spouse who gets attached to, you know, their, their wife or their husband. They're, it's a new person. It's someone you don't know, and you constantly have to work for that relationship. It's a relationship that doesn't just stay. It's not, bo- you're not born with it, Right. You you um you plant it, you you help it grow, and you never stop. Like sometimes you can be passionate, sometimes it can go. It's something that you constantly have to work. In that same relation, in 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 the relationship of marriage, you should have also a different kind of relationship, which is like a sister, and that's a relationship that God has to those two. Because in Galut, in in the exile. We, we, we were far away from God, we're disconnected from God, and that relationship of feeding and, and spouse doesn't exist, is going to die down. And if it was only that relationship, we would never have continued as a Jewish people. So that's where the sisterly love comes. Mm. And it's a love of siblings that, like, you can't, it's innate. No matter what, no matter how many years you can't talk to your sibling, the love is there. A sibling is family. It's there, and it's it, nothing can can break it. Nothing can can um, remove it. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to go into exceptions, but naturally, sibling love is always there, no matter how how much a sibling could hurt you, or it's there, and it's and it and you can you know you can. It doesn't just disappear. A spouse can divorce and it can stop. You can stop that emotion. You can stop that, you know, that relationship. So with God, there's those two relationships. And that's where the short, long way and the long, short way comes. It's the two relationship that are important. The one where you have to constantly meditate and work on and and feed and yeah, and feet so, you know, so it, it stays there, the, the relationship that's like a spouse. And then there's a relationship like a brother and sister where it's there no matter what. You just have to awaken it. You have to connect to it. It's not always awakened. You know, you're not always connected to it. You're not always aware of it, but it's always there. It's hard for me to see God as a brother or as a spouse because I, I bring a lot of respect and uh, fear. I've got that you don't have with a spouse or a brother. I don't know if you guys think the same. As a father, for me, is is more comme plus sacré, plus high. Mais j'arrive pas à imaginer avoir une relation avec God. En tant I think that's what the Tanya is bring, teaching us. Soeur, that's what the Tanya is teaching us. It's really bringing the relationship between when when you. You know, I, I guess I got my revelation when I was learning this chapter. I'm like, it's all about having a relationship with God. This is all about loving God, like love, like a relationship. This is what the Tanya is teaching us because people didn't have that relationship. They lost that relationship. It was, you know, it was, and, and the, the Alter Rebbe rebirthed, they rejuvenated. It was that relationship that came when God, and Matan Torah, when God married so to speak, the Jewish people. And it got lost. It got lost. And yes, not everyone feels it. And the time it teaches us, first of all, that's what God wants from us. That's what he wants, that relationship. And it's not easy because God is God, you know, like how do you just, and um, that's what the book of Tanya is. (laughs) This is what the book of Tanya is really teaching us. 
it's it's scary Alors, like ça you... désacralise je sais pas si le mot tu comprends ça veut dire c'est plus sacré parce que une sœur ou un mari c'est pas quelque chose de sacré comme pour moi dans plus la sacré. hiérarchie quoi c'est plus sacré malheureusement Dieu. Le, le, le de Dieu, il n'y a pas plus sacré. Non, la relation de, 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 de mari et une femme, c'est ouais. plus sacré qu'une une autre relation. Non, c'est pas ça. Le point, un... point c'est que je trouve que quand on descend Dieu à le comparer comme à une sœur ou à un mari, ou une femme, si tu es un homme, ça, ça rend Dieu moins sacré. C'est ça que, je, ça que je, je trouve comme... Et après, ça dépend de ce qu'on entend par « love of God ». Parce que right. pour moi, « love of God » comes with « fear of God », which I don't have with my siblings or with my husband. Well, all. it's, it's, it's the ideal relationship. Is, it's the ideal relationship. But you mean you should fear your brother? It's a, 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 a respect. Fear is having a certain respect. That, but ideally, it should. But we don't have that. But think of God, his relationship that he wants with us first of all the fact his I, i don't like putting a he or she but yes. the fact that god wants that oh my god i'm burning something in the oven sorry i just realized there's something you, you, you want to yeah. take it out uh, it's probably burnt take it out and, and close it yeah out. hi dana i thought i smelled something but I thought, yeah. I thought i was imagining that no I no i put something in the oven and i forgot sorry so So yeah, so Dorit brought up a, a very interesting point because um, she, she, I guess, and all, most of us don't see God as like a, a spouse or as a sister or that close relationship, but the Tanya is teaching us that this is what God wants from us. This is the relationship that God wants from us. He, the whole purpose of creation is to bring God into this world in his garden in his garden to really he he wants to come in this low world how do we do this by through torah and mitzvot and how do we do this even more is by ha by understanding that connection that we have with god who is like a spouse to us or like a and 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 through torah and mitzvot having that that um relationship with him so yes that is the first discourse that the Lubavitcher Rebbe said when he became a Rebbe was Basi Lagani Achaisi Kala. I came to my garden, my sister, my bride. It's talking about the whole mission of the Rebbe was to explain us that the whole, what God wants was for, uh, for us to bring him into his garden, back to his garden, to be with his Achaisi and Kala, his sister and his bride. So yes, it is a relationship. And I guess this is a concept that was new, that kind of, you know, like don't don't bring it down to the world. It, it was it was the, the whole concept that um the Alter Rebbe was and the world above was fighting, don't reveal these secrets. So I, I'm imagining that that is what um, I'm not. I'm imagining from my understanding. Yes, this. Imagine que ça va être dans les justement années. because it seems like you're bringing God, who's such a yes. infinite thing, into such what a spouse. Like how can you know? It seems that, but it's it's not. If it's, ça va être sure for sure, it's going to be developed. But this is this pour is pour what what God wants from how us. Can we bring him back to his garden. Isn't he the boss? But he wants us to bring him to his garden. He is the he boss. Wants he go. wants us to do the job. He can do it. He, it's not a job for, for God. Imagine the greatest gift he's giving us is to, to be able sure. to fix what, what we, what we ruined to begin with, you know, and back in, anyway, so we can get lost. Like I said, this chapter 18 is very in depth, very complicated. I'm just explaining you the first few words that explains the two different ways of attaining that love of God. So there's the long, short way. Mm -hmm. Again, that's the way to meditate and to really think deeply in, at, at, to the point where you're, you create an emotion in your mind that leads you to action. And now in chapter 18 to 25, the um, Alter Rebbe is going to explain to us that for those who want the short, long way, or for those who cannot meditate and think about God or doesn't know enough, 
there is a different way. And that's, that way is by connecting to that inner love that we're born with. Every Jew is born with. We inherited from our forefathers. And it's there. And we can see that many times it was awakened, uh, you know, whenever Jews were threatened um, by their life or by their Judaism, it came out. Even if their whole life they didn't care anything about God or Torah and mitzvah, they didn't do anything. But the minute their their life and their Judaism was threatened to the point where it was either you choose, you know, the life we tell you, or or you give you give up your Judaism, or you choose God and 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 Judaism, and they chose to give up their life in order for God. And, and and for his Torah. So it's under, you can't understand it. The only explanation is, the Alter Rebbe said, is that hidden love hidden. that is innate inside every Jew and that is awakened through Mesirat Nefesh, which is when your life is threatened and your Judaism and God is threatened, your belief in God is threatened. So, so through, Russia, everyone has it. Everyone has it. No matter what, everyone has it. Yes, even the Russia. Every Jew. Right? Every Jew has yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. And um, yes, and this love does not need meditation, and does not need any you know knowledge in order to um, to attain it. You just have to reconnect to it. And this chapter, I'm not going to go in how. But this chapter is going to teach us in the 18 to 25 how to reconnect to that love to the point where you have a desire and a motivation to serve God and to connect to God. Because the whole thing, what we're looking for right now is how to be motivated, right? Because it's very easy to do things uh, routinely and just, you know, but how can we have that motivation and that excitement? That's what God wants from us. He doesn't want us just to do things because we have to do it just out of duty. He wants us to do things because we are motivated to do it. We want to do it. We, we have an excitement. We have an emotion to do it. So those are the two ways to do it. We can do it through meditation, through attaining a, a understanding, uh, a, a love in the mind, or through reconnecting to our um, to our inner hidden love that is inside all of us okay. that we inherited. How do we reconnect to this one? Okay, so that's that's where we're gonna go more into depth next week. Okay, because I told you just to understand that first chapter mm -hmm. was was complicated, but yes, there is a way of connecting to it, and and. Um, yeah, the next chapter, it's, it's 12.49, I can't even start. The, uh, meditations here in Bodhidut, right? Bodhidut and, and just learning. When you take a concept and you learn, we learned how we take concepts okay. and we learn about them and, and to it's bring them down. You guys, I don't know, no, meditation, meditation is really thinking about like God and like and learning about him and, and, and putting your mind to it, not that kind of meditation, no. Okay. I actually never understood why meditation was not thinking, right? The the that. Ah, se reconnecter, la oui. Alors ça, maybe that's a different kind of meditation. Maybe that's the. Non, mais je parle de celle des asiatiques là ouais. où tu sais se reconnecter avec ton essence, avec exactly. tes, tes chakras et tout ça. Mais chez nous, j'aimerais bien une définition de ce quoi la. La meditation, real meditation, is to sit and to think about. God, when it talks about meditation here, is to use your chachma and your bina. Okay, you have a concept and you learn about it and you develop it and you think like, you think, oh my God, look how God is great. And you really think of the greatness of God and how he, but you need information for that. You can't just think like you, that's why it says it needs to be someone who knows how to learn. You need to open books and, and read. There's a bunch of books you can read about the God's greatness. And, and through that, you can create so people that don't know how to study or to read they cannot well that's why there's a second way for those who don't know uh, how to study and read okay, there's okay. a different way of connecting and arousing that love that will bring you to motivation and that's what the altar is going to explain us in the next chapter and um yeah so this is for chapter 18 and um any questions Donna, any questions? You missed the introduction. We spoke about uh, Yutet Kislev, the 19th of Kislev.
I will oh, ask Denisa has a. Denisa had a question, so I'll let her because her hand. Okay, go. <laughs> ah, no worries. Um, maybe you talked about it, but maybe I don't know. I, I mean, what are the four spiritual worlds? Because I think it's going to be connected oh, yes. with where the soul this comes. Very, very interesting. So we just spoke about it last week. There's four worlds. Oh yeah, sorry. There's there's, it's okay. I love I love reviewing, and it always help us helps us. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to my notes. So there's um, there's the highest world. By the way, there's more than just four worlds, but the four worlds that we're gonna understand that are in our that are part of our conscious as as human beings. These are the four worlds that we're connected to that we don't always attain. So there's the highest world with which is called Atsilut which is the oneness, okay? The, over there is oneness with God. The Atsilut, yeah. Then it goes down to the next world, which is called Bria, which is mind ecstasy. Transcendental awareness, okay? So it's with the mind. Okay. Then it goes down to the next world, and this is the whole universe functions with these worlds, and us as human beings, we function with them too. We're just not aware of it. The third world, it goes down to the third world, is called Yitzira, which is passion, which is the world of emotions. And the last world, which is our world, is the world of Asiya, which is the world of action. Okay, we usually stay, our conscious level is only conscious in the world of Atsiya. A tzaddik is able to be conscious on our, all four levels, someone who's very spiritual and is able to go up from at the world of action to the world of passion and that's why tzaddik is able to feel and have fiery love for god to the world of mind ecstasy and finally to the world of oneness with god we have that within us we have that potential but we cannot reach that consciousness that's why in our world it's very important action speaks more than any emotion or anything else action is what counts in our world if someone tells you they love you it doesn't matter but if someone acts and gives you time and does something for like you, that. and that is so much more important than mm -hmm. someone who yeah. has emotions for you. So that's what but when I, we sorry when we yeah. meditate, are we still like in the? That's a very field? good question. So yes, yeah, so what we learned is that that unfortunately we're not able to really go up to the next world of passion. The world of passion is really a. Um, a reward, this is going to be when in the times of Mashiach we'll be able to access it. Mm -hmm. When we, we're meditating, we're still staying in the world of action. And our meditation mm -hmm. for us to know if we really meditated right is if we see that we have actions. If someone okay. meditates about God and it leads him to keep Torah and Mitzvah because of it, that means his meditation was right and his love that he came to, even if he doesn't feel it in his heart, because the real love of God is is having this really fiery, passion, passionate love of God. But if it led him to action, this is good enough for God. And he will, you know, do the rest of the jobs that we, can, that we can't reach. So what I understand is that the, whatever passion we might have, like passion in the human term, is not really passion in the world of... Uh, it's not real it? passion. <laughs> because real passion doesn't die down. So they're not real okay. passion. Bye. Bye, guys. We also have to know that in this world, there's pieces. Uh, okay, I'm going into, I, I'm going to tell you quickly, but it's something that you can expand and learn more. But there's pieces of the higher worlds, right? There's pieces that, like, when God first created the world, he created the world of um, Tohu, and, and then it exploded because it was too high. So those pieces are hidden in this world, and sometimes we pick up on those pieces. It's a world that we can't really connect to, right? And um, so that's what I would translate as the passion that we pick up on. But if it comes and goes, that means it's not really real. Mm -hmm. Something that feels, that's truthful, it has to stay constantly and has to lead you to action. If that passion doesn't lead you to an action, then it's not real. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So you missed it. We were talking a lot of passion on what passion is. And I know. I was thinking about you. I'm like, why did you miss it? 
Well, I can wait to catch up on the so, class. It's on YouTube, should I mean? Yeah, it's all on YouTube. So yeah, so now we're going to learn in chapter 18 to 25, we're going to learn about a different kind of love. And um, I'm not wow. sure yet if it's, if, you know, maybe it's a love that kind of has that passion because it was a love that we inherited from our forefathers yes. that they were tzaddikim and they had that passion and they passed it on through, you know, it was passed on through the generation. So yeah. So yes, so this is our class today. Thank you for following. I'm gonna Thank stop. Thank you so much, Therna.